Hello, Representative Derek Kilmer here, welcoming you back to another edition of my Ask Derek video series, where I open up my mail and answer a question or two from folks back home. Recently, I heard from Bridget in Port Orchard about the importance of the Export-Import Bank to jobs and businesses in our region. Bridget, I couldn't agree with you more. The Export-Import Bank is actually a valuable tool in our economic development toolbox. It provides export financing and export insurance for American companies looking to sell American products to other parts of the world. And that's a good thing. And the arguments against it belong on an episode of Mythbusters. Here's a quick walkthrough. Some folks suggest that the Exim Bank meddles with private industry. False. In fact, the bank's charter prohibits it from competing with private financing. It only does deals no one else can. Some have suggested it costs taxpayers money. False. After covering expenses, it contributed more than a billion dollars to the U.S. Treasury last year. We've also heard suggestions in D.C. that no other countries do this or offer this. False. In fact, nearly every other country with whom we compete offers businesses this type of export financing. In fact, when we shut down the Export-Import Bank in the U.S., the head of the Exim Bank in China said, this is good news for China. Now. We actually made some progress on reauthorizing the Exim Bank in the House. We did it through a little known method called a discharge petition. A bipartisan majority of my colleagues, 218 to be exact, came together to sign a discharge petition that forced a vote on the reopening of the Export Import Bank to help create jobs on our shores. It's tremendously rare to successfully execute a discharge petition, not including the successful passage of Bruiser's Bill by Reese Witherspoon in Legally Blonde 2 red, white, and blonde. But we're still not done. Even though it passed the House with bipartisan support, the Senate needs to take this across the finish line. And I'm hopeful that the Senate will remember these mythbusters and reauthorize this bank that helps ship American-made goods around the world and supports the growth of our local businesses. Second, I also heard from Leo in Suquamish about the budget agreement that the President signed into law. I was glad to see Democrats and Republicans agree to a bipartisan deal that keeps our economy on track. Like every compromise, it isn't perfect, but political grandstanding was actually set aside so we could avoid our economy going off a cliff. This can do some good for folks in our region. It temporarily sets aside the threat of harmful sequestration cuts that have impacted paychecks and programs important to middle class workers in our neck of the woods. We can also make some investments in education and research so that our country can be a step ahead of our competitors. By protecting key portions of Social Security and Medicare, we can uphold our responsibility to seniors and to people with disabilities, ensuring that they can live with dignity. And we can better have the backs of the men and women who serve our country, our veterans. However, this agreement only set funding levels that Democrats and Republicans agreed to. Now we have to actually pass the package of bills that actually fund the government agencies and programs that folks rely on. My hope is that we can get this done in time to prevent a government shutdown. Now in order to do that, Congress needs to put its head down and get to work and avoid making any unrelated demands just to try to make a political point. So we got a few more days left to do that and I'll keep working toward that end. Thanks for tuning in and uh, keep the mail coming.